Well, hello, oddballs. It's your host, Bobby. And your co-host, Lexi. And this is Oddities, Oddities on, on Elm, Elm Street. Street. Welcome back for episode 30. 30. <laughs> it doesn't <laughs> seem like a lot. Like 30 isn't really a big number, but when but you think it of it in is. weeks, though... That's like over half a year. It's yeah, crazy. It it really is. Like we've and been doing this for a long time already. It just feels like second nature. Yeah. I don't know, but that's that I was actually thinking about that um the other day. I was like, we're about to do twenty nine. And it's like we're not even twenty nine. <laughs> is that really what you thought? <laughs> well, <Wow. I'm- laughs> Sorry. <laughs> that's um, a but no. Into my mind. <laughs> <laughs> that's how my mind works. I feel like it's, I mean, I think 50 or like 100 will be like, like a bigger smokes. deal, but this still feels like we hit a little milestone here, in my I opinion. I agree. So. I feel it in my soul. Yeah. Um, I go. So, thanks everyone for sticking around. Wow. We appreciate you. Thank you. And... Before we get started, I just want to say if there's something you want to hear from us that you haven't heard yet, then you should join our Patreon and you'll get access to a secret email address where you can send in all the topic suggestions wow. that your heart desires. Oh, and before I forget again, listener, listener tales. tales. Yes. Oh my God. I've been so horrible at remembering that. Um. So yeah, if you have a story that you want us to read, then send it to listenertales at gmail.com. Please. Please and thank you. And if you're going to end it with... I have more. (laughs) You you want to know. Yes. Yes. We do. The answer is yes. The answer is yes. So please just Just send send it on over. Just (laughs) send everything. Everything you can think of. Yeah. And, like, the lovely ladies from the first Listener Tales, you said that you had more. Yeah. We're here. I think only one of them answered. We want more. Please. Please and thank you. (laughs) Yes. Um, All right. So, for our morbid tidbit, I did look into the guy who was poisoning his wife's uh, protein drinks. Thank you. But there's no update. Okay, because... I've actually been thinking about it a lot, and I, I had like really? I, I had like five minutes at work in the bathroom. And I fucking was Did you look it up? And I was like, I can't find. Him. Yeah, there's been nothing since it happened back hmm. in like March, I think. But I did see his picture, and you. Yeah, gross. Um, so I'll share a new one. I look. I mean, I looked at some of the other ones, and I couldn't find updates for those either. Well, thanks I'm sorry. For trying. Um, but this one's cool. So, a deep sea recovery group was scanning through some pictures that were taken of the Titanic wreckage, Hmm. and they found a gold necklace with a megalodon tooth. Do you know what a megalodon is? You don't know what a megalodon is? No, I'm sorry. It's a prehistoric shark. It lived, like, millions of years ago. It's fucking huge. It was thought to be, like, one of... The largest predators to ever exist. Holy shit. Um, I want to see a picture. They were thought to have been up to 67 feet long. Oh, what? 67 feet. That's like a six-story building. This, folks, is why the ocean does not interest me. <laughs> um, what is it called? Megalodon. It's literally like mega- Ladon. <laughs> I think they have pictures of like their jaw with a like that. Yeah, yeah, that's the exact picture that came in mind. It's like it's unreal, is oh, what it what is. The hell? So yeah, someone on the Titanic had a necklace with a megalodon tooth on it. Okay, so how big was the fucking tooth? I don't know. And honestly, I looked at the picture, and it's it's kind of unclear. Because it's in, it's still in the ocean, at the bottom of the ocean. 
Um, okay, so for our topic today, it's going to be an unsolved mystery, right? But I feel like this is a topic where we have the ability to be vigilant. Proactive. Yes. Yeah. So while we're talking about this, probably toward the end, I'll be sharing some resources so that everyone's able to not just look into the case themselves, but also find ways in which we can be helpful in hopefully solving this case um, because it's still ongoing. So It's been almost exactly two years. Yep. So yeah, let's talk about it. So, at approximately 9 a.m. on June 23rd, 2021, 24-year-old Daniel Robinson was seen leaving his work site in the Buckeye Desert and hasn't been seen since. Daniel was a geologist and was in Buckeye, Arizona specifically, testing the groundwater. He was last seen by another worker driving away in his 2017 bluish-gray Jeep Renegade but it's believed that he headed west, which would have put him deeper into the desert, and that is the last time that Daniel Robinson was ever seen. Since his disappearance, Daniel's father, David, has been working tirelessly to find him. He picked up and moved his entire life from South Carolina to Arizona, where Daniel was last seen. I think a big issue with this case is that it happened just before the Gabby Petito case, which we all know got major press attention, Mm -hmm. but Daniel's case wasn't so lucky. In fact, the Buckeye Police Department has suggested some pretty interesting theories as to what might have happened to Daniel, including that he could have just decided to leave his life behind to join a monastery and become a monk. Like... I would be so pissed Yeah, if that was what I was told. David Robinson and the rest of Daniel's family have begged law enforcement to take this case more seriously, but they've also been very clear in stating that they are pushing forward to find out exactly what happened to Daniel, even if it means no help from law enforcement. So... Let's go over the timeline. Like I mentioned earlier, Daniel was last seen on his job site in the desert of Buckeye, Arizona. While he was there, he was testing the groundwater, which was part of his job as a field geologist. And on this morning of June 23rd, Daniel went out to this area in Buckeye to meet with one other man. The man he met with was named Ken and worked with a company called Weber. Him and Daniel had never met before. So what we know about his disappearance is all based on this other person's accounts Mm -hmm. of the events. The man that was meeting Daniel out there testified that they met at this job site around 9 a.m. on the morning of June 23rd, and by 9.15, he was watching Daniel drive away from the site in his Jeep Renegade. Ken explained that Daniel took the same road they drove in on, but instead of turning east, which would have brought him back to town, he turned west, which would take him deeper into the desert. After his disappearance, but on the same day, one of Daniel's co-workers showed up at Daniel's sister's apartment. He knocked on the door and asked if Daniel was there. It was then that Daniel's sister called their father, David. While David began calling around to see if any of Daniel's friends or family knew where he was, Daniel's sister headed over to his apartment to check on him. So, when she arrived at Daniel's apartment, she noted that his doors were locked and his vehicle was gone, but she was able to peek through the patio blinds and she sees that the living room light is on. So she tells her father, David, about this, and he immediately starts to worry that foul play might be involved, and he calls the Tempe Police Department to do a welfare check at around 7 p.m. 
it's also worth noting that there's a three hour <clears throat> time difference between Arizona and South Carolina. Um, so yeah, he calls the Tempe police department to do a welfare check. They denied this request. And then they diverted Daniel's case to the Buckeye Police Department because that is technically where he went missing. Right. So David then called the Buckeye PD to report Daniel missing. They told him he needed to wait 12 hours, which he later found out isn't even no, a thing. it's not a thing, um, but people still... Get, why do they tell you I, that? I, I don't know. But it makes me very angry. Because it's, it's like, it's obviously the most important time. Yeah, within the first 48 hours. I right, mean, that's right. why they always say that. Well, he's an adult, so he's allowed to go missing. It's like, give me a fucking break. I know. So after the 12 hours is up, David is able to report his son missing. According to police, they drove around the area that Daniel was last seen, and while they're conducting their search, David is already on his way from his home in South Carolina to Arizona to try to find Daniel. Mm -hmm. All along the way, he's calling his son's phone. It continuously rings before eventually directing the call straight to voicemail. That's gotta be... Heart-wrenching. Yes. Yes. It would be two to three days before an official search for Daniel was conducted. Police began by questioning the last man to see him and his co-workers. They also said that they would be going out into that area where he went missing and searching, but they were only searching along the roadway, not in the actual desert. Mm -hmm. When he requested that they search for Daniel in the desert, David is told that because his son is an adult, there's no reason to believe that he couldn't have just walked away on his own accord. He's a monk now. That request was again denied the next morning. So it's at this point that Daniel's aunt calls the Buckeye PD. It's not exactly known what that conversation sounded like, mm -hmm. but it finally resulted in the action that they needed. The police department said they would conduct a helicopter search of the area. Um, there are some discrepancies with this helicopter search because according to the police report, that search was conducted on the 25th, but David says that it wasn't actually conducted until Daniel had already been missing for three days on June 26th. Also, according to what police told the media, the helicopter search lasted 12 hours, but David says it was more like two. Yeah. So, it's at this point that Daniel's case is assigned to Detective Larry Biffin. Detective Biffin conducts interviews and calls to request Daniel's phone records. But unfortunately, they're not able to ping his phone, and none of the information provided would really help them in their efforts to locate him. When Daniel's father, David, talks to Detective Biffin, he mentions that he hasn't been able to get access to Daniel's bank account records. But the detective doesn't really offer any solutions or any help, mm -hmm. uh, but instead just kind of suggested that David should hire a lawyer to get power of attorney over Daniel's affairs. Thankfully, though, they were eventually able to access those bank records where they learned a little bit more information about the timeline of his disappearance. Um, from those bank records, they can see that he stopped for gas on his way to the job site that morning. But most importantly, they can see that there was no activity after Daniel was last seen. Although a welfare check was conducted at Daniel's apartment, police don't make entrance. Uh, in fact, it wouldn't be until 13 days after his disappearance that police finally 
enter Daniel's apartment. Well, they had to get to, like, work with the landlord. I heard that the family was being denied access by the landlord. But when the police department asked, hmm. there was no issue at all with the landlord letting them right into his apartment. Interesting. So they do finally get into his apartment, but unfortunately that doesn't really give them a lot to go off from either. There's nothing valuable missing. Nothing appears to have been like packed up. Um, and there was no sign of a struggle. So after leaving Daniel's apartment, police began to set up flyers around the area that Daniel was last seen, hoping that either like the workers or possibly the landowners or ranchers would see him and keep an eye out for him or for his vehicle. More extensive aerial searches were conducted, but unfortunately it didn't lead them any closer to finding Daniel. During this time, Daniel's father, David, is also conducting his own weekly searches. And there's part of the interview that made me feel just awful for him because he's kind of explaining how doing these searches in the desert forced him to face this really cruel reality. Hours and hours in the sun was exhausting and the dangerous wildlife. Yeah, so, it's, it's not it's not a place It's not you meant be. for survival. No, no not so at all. So imagine the thoughts that are crossing your mind knowing that this is where your child went missing. Right. Um right. As you're out there for half a day. Yeah. And he right. could possibly still be out there. Right. Um so, something that I think is really unfortunate in Daniel's case is that because multiple people that had seen Daniel before his disappearance said he was acting strangely, mm -hmm. that almost gives police permission to not act urgently because it for them, it solidifies the idea that he probably left on his own, mm -hmm. of his own free will. Mm -hmm. um, this lack of urgency is also partly due to some of the events that led up to his disappearance. Mm -hmm. Although there was never any worry that Daniel would hurt himself, those around him said that he did seem a little bit, uh, not like himself, like a little off. withdrawn. Yeah. Um. And it's believed that that's mostly in part due, like, it's mostly due to a failed relationship, relationship air quotes, I should say. So Daniel had a second job as an Instacart shopper. And one night while he's making an Instacart delivery, his customer invited him into her home. They chatted for a bit. I guess she sent him a podcast to listen to, and the two of them parted ways shortly after. But after this, Daniel was interested in this woman, and he wanted to pursue her. Mm -hmm. But it seemed like this woman wasn't really interested in, in Daniel romantically. Mm -hmm. And at one point, he realized that he had left something in her house, so he showed up at her place unannounced and this woman told Daniel that it made her feel uncomfortable but he again shows up at her house unannounced not cool yeah and it's it's fair for her to feel that way absolutely for sure. and she communicated that she's setting boundaries like that's right. just a healthy thing to do exactly definitely respectable so the day before Daniel goes missing on June 22nd we can see from the text logs that this woman reminds Daniel that he doesn't have her permission to show up at her home and that she doesn't want to see him anymore. So, Daniel responds. He sends one more text mm -hmm. to this woman. And it... It's weird. Yeah. It's... 
I know. It's, I don't know what to make of it. Right. Right. It's Like, it, what does it mean? I don't know I if don't it know has it means, to do right. with the podcast that they listen to. Right. Or, right. I don't know. It's, it's just. It's eerie and confusing. It is. So the text said, quote, the world can get better, but I'll have to take all the time I can or we can, whatever, to name it. I'll either see you again or never see you again. Like, I just wish we had context. I want to know what podcast she shared. I with know. Him. I wonder if they looked into that. You know, I right. I don't know. I if haven't been able to find it anywhere. Me neither. But I wonder if it's just irrelevant. So they're just not saying anything about it. I don't. Maybe. But I don't know. Now, almost 30 days later, on July 19th, Daniel's Jeep Renegade was found completely totaled in a 20-foot ravine. A rancher discovered it just a few miles from where he was last seen. Found next to the vehicle in a pile was everything that Daniel had on his body. All of the clothing he wore that day, including his socks and underwear, his t-shirt, his work boots, and his jeans with the wallet still in his back pocket. But Daniel was nowhere to be found. It was noted in the report that there was no blood found in the car at all. Right. It didn't seem as if he had hung around his his Jeep to wait for help, um, because they found a bunch of unopened water bottles. Um, Which is crazy. Right, you're in the desert. This is, I mean... That's like better... That's the best thing you can pass. It's it's your lifeline. Right. So that suggests that he had left shortly after whatever had taken place, right? Unfortunately, they weren't able to see any footprints to suggest which direction he could have walked off in because by the time that they've discovered his Jeep, it's already rained it's been a month. three times. It's exactly. So his keys... His phone and his wallet were all left behind. The Buckeye police began their search in this area where the Jeep was found. And along with other equipment, they brought cadaver dogs Mm -hmm. in an attempt to locate Daniel's body. But the dogs weren't even able to pick up a scent that suggested that Daniel would have been there in the first place. Even with the pile of clothing that was found there. So, if Daniel was ever out in this area where his Jeep was found, the dog should have picked up on his scent, but they didn't, which leaves more questions than answers. Mm -hmm. The police also didn't do any forensics on the Jeep. They didn't take any swabs. They didn't look for fingerprints. Um, so frustrating. Like, I feel like most of these unsolved cases are still unsolved because the Police refuse to do their job. They're like, yeah, they find, they look for any sort of thing that they can latch on to to say, yeah, like, he chose to do this. Right. Or like... Just like in Tamala's case. Right. There's, there's... Yes. And, like, his theory of, oh, well, he must have gotten a head injury, then, sh- you know, yeah. stripped, his, stripped clothes his clothes and then left and died from the elements. Yeah. It's like, how far do you think you would have gotten? And you wouldn't find anything? And you wouldn't find any remains at all? And it's three miles away from Where he the was site. last seen, yeah. That's not very far. And the fact that they didn't find his car in the search... Right. ...is what gets me. Right. It took almost 30 days... And just some random fucking rancher to find it. I just don't understand. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't add up. So Daniel's dad, David, asks, like, why? Why did you not take any swabs or look for fingerprints? Nothing. Their reasoning, they say they don't believe it's relevant because it's his vehicle. So who else would be driving it? Like, oh, my God. So... 
At this point, David hires a private investigator to help with Daniel's case, which I think is a very smart move. Thank God. Yes. But it sucks that it has to come to that. Absolutely. Um, yeah, we should be able to depend on the... F- At least trying. Right. At least giving a fucking effort. So, police downloaded the crash data from Daniel's car. Mm-hmm. They said it didn't... They didn't find much, is what they said. Right. Um, it's irrelevant. Yeah. And according to their report, the only thing they were really able to see was that the car was driving up to 30 miles per hour for around five seconds before crashing. But when the private investigator does his own analysis into the crash data... And he's, like... And he's like former he has, law enforcement. Right, and he has, like, background in crash analysis. Yes, so yes. Like this is... This is his expertise. Well, yes, he knows what he's doing with this. It's not just... Right. Like so if guessing. anyone... If you should trust anyone with this information, it's him. Right. Okay? He finds that Daniel's car would crash four hours... After he left the job site. This discovery means that the Jeep had been there the entire time. Supposedly. Just a few miles away. And another thing is, after getting the chance to look at the Jeep, the private investigator finds a section of red paint transfer Mm -hmm. on Daniel's car. That suggests that Daniel struck something with red paint... Which is not in the desert. Right. Before crashing into this ravine, obviously they took a look around, couldn't find what that might have been. So that's still unknown. Well, and from what I saw, he, like, said that there was a huge, there was a lot of damage to, like, specifically the right front side of his car and that he didn't see any sort of thing that could have had that impact Mm. in that vicinity. Interesting. And that's when he, like, really dove into the black box of the car Mm -hmm. and decided to, like, really go investigate that when he, like, went and got his own car and tried to get, like, the speeds and all that, right? Yeah. He was really confused because it was saying for... It was longer than five seconds. It was like a, I can't remember exactly how long, but it was like a decent amount of time that it was going like upper 20s to 30 miles an hour before it crashed. And so then he went and got his own. It was like a Jeep Wrangler that he had Mm -hmm. to see how fast he could go. And it was like 15 miles an hour that he could go because the terrain is just crazy. He went and got, In ORV Mm -hmm. and tried and then he got into like like the twenties range. But he's like, I have no idea how you would be able to go that fast in this terrain because it is so rough. Interesting. Also putting together that he didn't see anything that could have made that specific damage to the right front side. Even driving off into a ravine. Right. Hmm. Because, I mean, I would have no fucking idea how to do it, but you can see, like, certain... He's trained in this, right? Yeah, like, yeah. Like, he can investigate and figure out, like, well, it, how yeah. something got right to be the way it is. Right. And it makes sense with a vehicle. You have to line up what's dented with where the vehicle landed. Right. You know? Right. And so he's like, what... Well, what I got out of it, it seems like he's thinking that it happened somewhere else. And the vehicle was staged. Yes. Mm. And, and you know, also looking at the fact that it wasn't found until 30 days after. Exactly. But it was a few miles away. Right. And they supposedly looked along the roadways or whatever it's not like, like it's covered in like brush, brush or debris yeah. or whatever right. it's it's a it's a blue jeep yeah in the red desert if a ranch uh, if a rancher is able to spot it you know well he's just out looking why for wouldn't animal. why wouldn't you know the 12 hour extensive ride. searches right. be able to locate that within the three days right after he was missing 
And if it crashed that same day that he went missing, you can't say, well, oh yeah, he went rogue and went out this way or that way and then eventually decided to go back into the yeah. desert. I don't know. What it happened just... between those four hours? Well, what happened in that month? Yeah. It's so it's like that black box is very interesting. Yeah. The PI also found that the Jeep continued driving for 11 miles mm-hmm. after the airbags were deployed and that someone had tried repeatedly to restart the Jeep after it crashed, like over 40 times. Mm-hmm. Just doesn't, it just doesn't line up. Like, that's why I said before we started even recording this, I said that I have so much to say about it, but... No. None of it. I I can't comprehend it. Like none of it you makes can't any put sense to me. All the pieces together in exactly. any sort of way. Like not even. I can't really come to any theories. Exactly. It's like not where other cases where there's so many different theories that it seems like like the Panama. Yeah. Ones. It's right, like there are right. so many different theories, but then like maybe one little piece doesn't add up. But this one, it's like none of the pieces. Add up. It's like total different. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's different puzzles, uh, and it exactly. just doesn't make any. The pieces sense. don't even go together. Right. <sighs> Daniel's father, David, he has worked to get Daniel's disappearance accelerated from just a regular missing missing persons case to an endangered missing persons case. That request was denied, which is crazy, because. I was listening to, I think Sarah Turney talks about it because she's in Arizona. Yeah. And she's like, people take going missing in the desert very seriously because it's very serious. Because okay. you're not meant to survive out there. Right. So regardless so, if they tried to walk off on their own or whatever, like, they are in danger whether they're right. trying to put themselves in it or not. Like, fucking Absolutely. go try to find them. And just the fact that, you know, they're... David is doing these weekly searches, and he found, like, seven hum- yes. different human remains. Right. And none of them were his son. Seven, seven different people. I can That imagine were in the desert. And that he just found. That he just he's found because, he, yeah. And the police department's not looking. Like, that's what it takes, you know? And I heard that the same thing about, like, uh, Gabby Petito's case, too. Right, because, yeah, exactly. They found, they like, found, five I don't know different... how many, right, but yeah. they found a whole lot more than right. what they were going and so to look for. I totally agree. It's like, even if he walked away of his own free will, say he wanted to start a new life, whatever, it's still the fucking desert. Well, and, <laughs> right, and the guy that met him at the work site, Ken, mm-hmm. he was saying that, like, he got a call from either Daniel's company or something that Daniel hadn't shown up. Yeah. And so Ken, like, followed his tracks, and I guess it got to this T, basically, where it's either you can go east go towards east home or, or right, right. west towards more, more desert. vast desert. And yeah. he said that his heart just dropped when he saw that it went west because he's like... He knew. There's no, like, you can't even begin to... Like, he could try all he wants to go west and look, but it's like, then you're putting yourself in danger. Right, right. Um, That should be enough. That should be enough to be like, okay, um, we haven't... Which is why David was so adamant about them doing the aerial searches. Right. Because it's such rough terrain. They don't want to go out there in their vehicles. You know what I mean? So. It's just oh, it's you don't so go frustrating. Out there. You can't. I mean, on foot. Come on, give me a break. Yeah. And your vehicles. You can only go as we see if you have an RV. Twenty miles 20 an hour to thirty miles an hour, if that. Right. It's like the very best thing would be an aerial search. Yeah. So yeah, they deny the request to list. Daniel as an endangered missing person. Instead, they offered two theories for what they believe could have possibly happened to Daniel. 
The first being that Daniel crashed his car into the ravine, and suffering a head injury, he stripped himself of his clothing and wandered off into the desert where he most likely died from exposure. Okay, then where's his body? Why didn't the cadaver dogs pick up his scent? Why is the why is all of the forensics of the vehicle why does that well, not, none of it make sense? It, it it's like do they even try to explain any, any of this? Or are they just like, yep, well, this is what I have to say and bye. Like I don't know. It just baffles me that they can it, even do that. Yeah. Okay, um, sorry. No, it's okay. So, secondly, that Daniel left his life behind to mm. become a monk. Right, right, right. Um, Is there a monastery in the desert? <laughs> so, they the reason they believe this is because of that odd behavior that was reported before his disappearance, but it's like... Okay. My God, what a fucking extreme. That's a jump. That is a yeah. jump if I've ever heard one. Like... How did they come to that conclusion? I don't know. I, I seriously have no idea. And it's like... You drive into the desert to be a monk? That's what gets like, me is they, they, well, he might, he's an adult, so he can leave whenever he wants to. Why would you choose to leave by going into the desert? Exactly. How are you able There's, to start your life over right. wandering through the desert? That is a very, That makes no sense. Exactly. Exactly. It's just if you want to start your life over, you wear a disguise and you or, catch yeah. the ni- next flight out of here. Right. You're not going to drive deeper into the desert. Like, right. what is it? What's out there? Uh, vast desert. Not the ability the to Mexico start a new border, life or to join a monastery. Are, yeah. Yeah. It, I, I also um, heard in that show that. Arizona's in, like, the top five states with the most missing persons, which I didn't know, but it makes sense. And I and wonder it, if it's because of the desert. That's, I'm sure that's what it is. And obviously, I mean, they go out and they find seven other fucking people. Right. Like, it seems like maybe missing persons in the desert are not taking all that seriously. Oh, absolutely. It, like, I mean... Look at the urgency. Right. You know, there is none. Um, and what's frustrating is that they refuse to entertain any other ideas. It is, it's beyond me. I do not, I do not understand. Yeah. It's frustrating because if foul play is involved with Daniel's disappearance, his case has already been hindered by what police believe because of the behavior that he displayed you know, right before going Prior, missing. yeah. Right. So, and I think we said that earlier, the private investigator thinks that the crash scene was staged. Mm-hmm. Okay. Just wanted to make sure we, mm-hmm. we mentioned that. Um, so we're now coming up on two years since Daniel Robinson's disappearance, but just recently we've learned some new revelations about his case. Which I thought was very odd because- so weird the timing of yes, this I've yes been, i've been like kind of suggesting it for a while but we've yeah. always had other things that were like oh actually let's do this well but we've then, had things lined up because of like people requesting stuff yeah, on patreon exactly, and stuff right but then you know last time you were like what do you want to do and i was like oh you know what maybe we should do daniel robinson's case mm-hmm. and we're like yeah okay great and then i feel like the next day i saw like yeah. on reddit or something an update and I was like, yeah, and you sent real? it to me and you're like, this is literally happening in real time. I'm like, like what? And it you're is like, what very- plants did you get? Me? <laughs> no. I'm like, it's a fucking fox. <laughs> Do you see this shit? <laughs> I know. I think you replied to it and I was like, oh shit, I forgot to answer. <laughs> I know. I'm like, <laughs> yeah. <on> me. <laughs> I was very concerned about the plants. <laughs> It's like, I just need to make sure that they get enough sunlight. I'm glad you care. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, super fucking weird. It really was. And I'm I'm glad that we caught it. Like, I'm glad we waited until now. Because yeah. you've been suggesting this for probably a month now. Uh-huh. But I'm glad that we're doing it now that we have information. Because if we would have done it a month ago... That would have sucked. It would have sucked because then I'd have to... 
It's just the universe Make a doing sep- its I thing. I know. It really is. Um, so we are now able to see more information in the report about Daniel's devices Mm -hmm. that's been released, including some Google searches. And those consist of things like, should I call her? Can you break your lease before it renews? Delete Instagram account. And love changed me. Also, wasn't there one that was like, Tempa shootings? Yes, yes, yes. You're and, right. And also something that we didn't mention is that he went missing and his brother and sister were like trying to figure out what happened beforehand and they found that he had deleted all of his Instagram photos. Had he? Yes. Isn't that just weird? Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. They're in... I wonder what that's all about. I don't know. I I don't know. But it was... Hmm. Like, to go and literally delete all of your photos on Instagram. But then it's also, like, why would you not just, like, delete your Instagram? Yeah. I don't know. It was just... It's just another weird little Tip puzzle it. piece. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and that just... I don't know. It It seems like this incident that happened with this woman, like... Like, he was almost trying to change himself to be what she wanted him to be, maybe. He he was going through something. Definitely. And I also, his mom mentioned that when they were able to see his apartment, that it was, like, kind of trashed. Like, it was really gross. Mm Mm-hmm. And his brother went on to say, like, I've lived with him since he was born. And, like, he is not, like, was out of organized. Character for him. He's not, like, super organized. But, like, nothing like this. Hmm. She, it was, like, her, his mom said that there were just piles of dishes in the sink and on the floor. And, like, she, I think that she said, not verbatim, but something along the lines of, she walked in and she could feel his misery. Mm. Just like... That's sad. Damn. It reminds me of, like, depression dens. hmm Which is, like, for sure a real thing. hmm And he also made a call to his mom. They played the uh, voicemail. The last voicemail that his mom got from him. And it's... It's basically like, hey, like, I guess I'll, I'll talk to you later, but I just really want you to know that like, I love you and I always will. And she just said that she can just hear, like, something in his voice that is just not right. So, you know, all of this is worrying me. I know. He was, it's like, it, and it makes me... It's, it's, it's kind of like bittersweet because it's nice to know this stuff, but then it's also like just more shit for the police to grasp onto and be like, yeah, 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 like, yeah. he wasn't okay. He's, well, that's what he went to the monastery. Like, that's what I mean. It's like, you know, people saying, well, he was acting strange and the Google searches and the text message, like. That all hindered his investigation because now police feel like they have a free pass to just brush it under the rug as just another guy who left of his, you know. Own accord. Yeah. But, no, it's just. But obviously something had to have happened. Something was going on. Your, Your Jeep doesn't just end up totaled in the middle of the desert. Your clothes are lying next to it and you're nowhere to be found for your underwear not just like you're you're not like you just took your t-shirt off and like i feel like people in arizona know that like you wear clothes like you don't you don't go out into the desert because of sun exposure yes exactly like you wear protective clothes right so as a geologist working in Arizona, wouldn't you think that he would know to 
That's it. I and then they're like, well, there's a head injury, but it's like, wouldn't uh, if you had? I I just feel like there'd be blood. It just right, exactly. It just doesn't. It just really. It it's like you go in circles. Yeah. <sighs> um. So this report that they released, it also shows that Daniel's phone at the crash site, it shows his phone at the crash site at 10.05, mm-hmm. and it had stopped tracking just after 10.30. There's also a witness named Bill who claimed to have seen Daniel in the area after he disappeared. He noted Daniel's new Jeep. He said that Daniel was wearing a reflective work vest. And most importantly, that Daniel was missing part of his arm. Which I realized just a little bit ago that we hadn't said anything about that. Well, it doesn't seem it's relevant, but, but right. this is this but. this is the relevant part where I was going to mention it. Because he was born missing part of his arm. Missing part he was born without his right hand. And that's how the the TV it's like show elbow down, I believe. Right, right? But that's just what his dad said. It it seems that that would prove that this witness Bill really did see him mm-hmm. because Daniel was born missing part of his arm, and he didn't wear a uh, prosthetic. Correct. Um, but this witness's claims were kind of discredited because he. I guess he originally said that he spotted Daniel at around 1130, but then he changed his story a couple times about the time that he saw him. And police also noted that these claims don't really seem to align with the data that they found on Daniel's phone. Right. Well, they said that they couldn't even, like, validate that what he's saying is true, and then let alone anything that he's saying is not lining up with his phone records. Right. So it's like, what? And they're like, there's, I guess, suspicion about him lying about having a background in... In law enforcement. Right. And, yeah. But then they also mentioned, like, we don't really know why he would go about lying about this. And it's like, yeah, why? Like, what why, was the motive be? What is... Exactly. Why That's what I was going to say. Like, if he is lying about that encounter, like, what? Like, what's your motivation you for doing so? just a shitbag and trying to be involved in it? Like... Who knows? I mean, it happens. I know. I know, which is just its own little... I mean, uh, there's a small part of me that hopes that he's telling the truth and that Daniel is okay. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, not a small part of me. There's a big part of me that hopes that um, he really did see him after his Jeep might have crashed into that ravine or whatever might have happened. But... I don't know. It just... It's just another one of those... Things. Mm-hmm. Daniel's father is hosting a virtual candlelight vigil for his son this month on the 23rd. On the 23rd, yeah. He also has tons of resources for how you can help. Um, that is on a website that he's set up called pleasehelpfinddaniel.com. Not only are there resources there, he's also very active on that site, and he keeps it updated very regularly. Mm-hmm. On that website, pleasehelpfinddaniel.com, there is a link to a petition you can sign to help get justice for him. There is a GoFundMe link where you can donate to help cover any expenses like the private investigator expense right. or the, you know, the searches, right. hotel ex- expenses for any of the family there are events you can attend. Uh, you can volunteer your resources for the search. If you're in the area, you can volunteer to help search. Right. Yourself. Right. And I know that I also heard, like, if you, like you said, resources, but, like, specifically if you have any sort of, like, ORV. Right. Like a quad or anything like that, that's would be super helpful for Absolutely. them to use. Yeah. Yeah. Um, And if, you know, if there isn't a way for you to help in in those ways, Mm -hmm. um, he even has flyers on there that you can print out and hang up. Right. Um, 
So I'll make sure to have that linked in the podcast description. Please take the time to go check it out. You can learn everything you need to know about the case there. And honestly, like it's effort like that, that are able to help bring answers. Well, right. It's like Sarah Turney. She is phenomenal. I don't know if anyone knows much about her. If not, you need... You need to go listen to Voices for Justice, Mm -hmm. starting with season one, because she goes into a very, very in-depth, it's like season one, about her sister that went missing. Mm -hmm. And basically, she's in Arizona, right? Her sister went missing. All this shit is like... um, very similar to Daniel in the the fact that it's like, okay, like, this is not okay. We need to look into it. Right. And the police are just, like, not fucking about it. But she was essentially told, like, media is the only way that you can go about it. Mm -hmm. Like, that's that's your only other thing that you can do. So she she went out and she did it. And now the case is reopened. She's a badass bitch. Mm -hmm. And now she's trying to really help other families and that's where I first heard about this mm-hmm. was when she did an episode I don't know when but it was like shortly it was after it right actually a- happened right I think it was six months after this happened yeah it was in November of the same year okay yeah mm-hmm. and then it reminds me of you know I think crime junkie often says like the squeakiest wheel is the first to get attention yeah like talking about these things and just keeping it keeping it relevant and alive and right just it's it's the only thing we can do right right you know it's the only thing that especially like collectively as a society Mm -hmm. we can do to help move something along or at least just to not have it fade away Right. And turn into one of these... Turn into another cold case. Old case. Cold case, yeah. yes. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, again, just one more time. That website is pleasehelpfinddaniel.com. And lastly, before we end, I just want to say they do have um, a tip line set up. If you know anything regarding Daniel's disappearance, you can call the Buckeye PD at 623 349 Six four nine nine. Anything else that you'd like to add before I close it out, ma'am? <clears throat> I mean, I would love to know what everyone thinks. It's another one of those that it's like, yeah, I don't know what to make of it. Do you guys? And I would definitely like to hear some ideas of what you guys think could have possibly right taken place. Just to make it make sense. And again, to keep the conversation going. I got a lot of my information from Sarah Turney, her podcast, Voices for Justice, also Mm -hmm. Killer Psyche. And I watched um, on Prime, they have a series called Disappeared. And it is season 10, episode 2, Disappearance in the Desert. And it has some really good interviews with all the family members and the PI and stuff. That's where, that's where I got a lot of, all of my information. So if you're interested and want to hear more, I would definitely recommend going and looking at all those. Those and the website that David set up. Yes, yes. Please Definitely would give you all the information you need. Keep on digging. Keep the conversation going. Let's fucking find him. Let's find Daniel. Um, So, yeah, thank you all for joining us. Thank you. And remember to always Always keep keep it spooky. spooky.